What a joy to see all of you today. Isn't it a wonderful day? Isn't it a wonderful day to be in the house of God? <clears throat> uh, you know, uh, it's the best place to be in all the world, God's house. And one day you're going to realize that when He comes back to get us because this church that you're a part of is what He built. He built this church. And He said up on this rock, I'm going to build it and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So you're in something that's indomitable. You're in something that uh, can't be destroyed. His church is going to continue. Would you stand? You're incredible people. I've got to get right into the Word today because everybody takes my time. <laughs> and I love it. I love it. Thank you for being so kind to us. Uh, Brad and I and uh, Cass and Kate went to Detroit on Wednesday to take care of Pastor Randy's father's funeral. And... Uh, we enjoyed the journey with my kids and with my son-in-law, and uh, we enjoyed being there with some wonderful people. But it's good to be home in Austin, Texas, and I'm through with vacation. Is Patty here? Is Patty in the house? Is she over there? She's not over there? Patty's not in a wheelchair today. <laughs> Patty, that's right, that's right. And she told me the next time I went to Las Vegas to preach to go by myself. No, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> Amen. This is Freedom Sunday. Say Freedom Sunday. Freedom Sunday. Next Sunday's Baptism Sunday. We've got a group of people already signed up to be water baptized next Sunday. And uh, looks like summer's kind of coming to an end. We're starting to see some folks gather. This is an awesome crowd today. Clap your hands for that. <clears throat> I'm speaking today on the subject Lazarus also, Lazarus also. Now, when they gave me something that they wanted me to preach about today, sometime an assigned topic is di more difficult to get a grip on than something that you just feel in your spirit. And so this assigned topic caused me to reflect <clears throat> and go back and rediscover some things that perhaps I had used in my past about freedom and so today I'm speaking on Lazarus also, but I'm going to Galatians chapter 5. So Christ has made us free. Now make sure you stay free and don't get all tied up again in the chains of slavery. Now what Paul was talking about there was legalism. He was talking about legalism. Don't leave grace. Don't leave grace to go back to legalism. And then in the message chapter 5 and 1, the message says Christ has set us free to live a free life. So take your stand. Never again let anyone put a harness of slavery on you. Everybody say, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. For, your grace. for your grace. You may be seated. I love you, and I'm going to preach to you a little bit today. So I ask a question, what is freedom? Great question. For some people, freedom means a freedom from. Freedom from the federal government. <laughs> freedom from responsibilities. Freedom from traditional morality. Freedom from tyrannical bosses. Freedom from implacable spouses, those you can't please. Professor Higgins in My Fair Lady said, I'm an ordinary man who desires nothing more than just an ordinary chance to live exactly as I like and do precisely what I want to do. That is what freedom is to many. They want to do exactly as they like and precisely what they want. It's a freedom from if that means leaving behind moral restraints or social responsibilities or even those they love, then so be it. See, people today want freedom from just about anything that would limit their personal desires. It's a sad day in our world. In this century, the slow erosion of traditional values is freeing people from the last social institution to which traditionally they have been tied and I call it the family. One writer calls us a nation of leavers. Our forefathers left Asia and Europe to immigrate to America. Then as the frontier opened, they moved west until they came to the ocean. Now, with no place to go, we are leaving each other. Freedom from. This kind of freedom is very popular these days. Freedom from anything that would limit my personal autonomy. 
Freedom from social constraints, crying kids, the daily grind. The cry is, I want freedom from some things. And we're looking for freedom from. But there's another kind of freedom, a more exhilarating form of freedom, which we call a freedom to. A freedom to. For example, the freedom to be all God created us to be. That's a great freedom too. We've been celebrating the Olympics this year. I watched it. I don't mind telling you, I OD'd on the Olympics. I'm still an old boy that loves the USA. I still love Lee Greenwood when he sings it 35 years later. God bless America. And I'm so glad that we beat China in the medal race. Sorry. I'm an American. I'm an American. And we had some Asian people help us beat those people. <laughs> We've been celebrating the Olympics this year. And Olympic athletes enjoy a freedom that you and I don't. You understand that. These athletes have conditioned their bodies to respond in a way that they are able to run faster than people have ever run before and leap higher than anyone has ever leaped before. And at the same time, show a tremendous physical grace and dignity than most of us can ever imagine. Folks, that's freedom. Most of us can tell our bodies to perform these feats like those unlevel parallel bars or whatever those unlevel bars. That's one of the scariest things I've ever seen in my life. Letting go of something and grabbing something higher and letting go of that and grabbing something lower. And I saw some kids miss this year and it hurt when they hit. It hurt me when they hit. But that's freedom. That's freedom. Most of us can tell our bodies do that and our body says, what? You want me to do that? This is bluebell and that's barbell. <laughs> I, can't, I can't get there, boy. <laughs> so I just do it in my mind. I say, I could do that. Because the older you get, the better you were. You know that. Many of us are prisoners of our own bodies, prisoners of years of neglect. But we need to see that this is not only true of athletes. People have advanced training and ability and any kind of any kind enjoy this same kind of freedom. Some people spend their whole lives in one job and can't change no matter how much they desire to change because that's all they have been trained to do. Others, on the other hand, have worked hard in school and they have kept growing after leaving school. And they can choose from the great many jobs at a superior level of pay. I have a lesson for young people today. It's just... Five words, young people, stay in school. Stay in school. Anybody want to give me a witness on that? Stay in school. Go as far in school as you're able. For most people, education and ability equal freedom. You may think leaving school gives you freedom from, freedom from grouchy teachers, freedom from boring assignments, and freedom from homework and writing essays. But education is actually the path to freedom. The more knowledge you have, the greater your range of choice. You see, freedom from and freedom to are often in conflict. Sometimes we have to give up one freedom in order to gain a greater freedom. Athletes understand this. They have to subject themselves to grueling discipline. I saw a kid that played for the Dallas Cowboys last night pulled a semi that had a trailer behind it and pulled it with a, with a rope around, a, a chest thing around itself, pulled it up and down the road to get himself in shape for the football season. They gave him the ball last night to get one yard and he hurt some people getting two yards. He can move a truck. He can move a man. And then musicians understand this. Is there anything more boring than spending hours of practice and scales? But the greater freedom of being able to play a magnificent sonata is worth it. The price of temporary drudgery. Scientists understand this. The hours spent mastering chemistry and physics. The math pays off and freedom to do marvelous things in the laboratory. But there is another freedom, a freedom in your spiritual life, in spiritual things. Not a freedom from, not a freedom to, but a freedom of spiritual things. That comes only with discipline and denial, like taking time in a Bible study in the morning, giving yourself about 15 minutes or so just to read a chapter or two, just to understand that God wants to talk to you through the Word because He became the Word made flesh and dwelt among us. So when you read his word, you're talking and you're reading what he has to say to you. And then taking some time to pray. Amen. Are you spending sufficient time reconnecting with the one who is the source of life itself? That's the question. Are you leading a disciplined life morally? Wise persons 
have always recognized that freedom does not mean the absence of constraints or moral absolutes. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Suppose a skydiver at 10,000 feet announces to the rest of the group, I'm not going to use a parachute this time. I'm just going to free fall. I want freedom. But the fact is that the skydiver is constrained by a greater law. It's called the law of gravity. When a skydiver chooses a constraint of the parachute, he or she is free to enjoy the acceleration of the leap. See, God's moral laws restrain, but they're absolutely necessary to enjoy the exhilaration of real spiritual freedom in your life. Come on, clap your hands of that. Jesus said in Luke chapter 4, when he came out of the wilderness, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind, and set at liberty them that are broken, bruised, and hurt. He wants to help us. I want to preach now. The book of John is loaded with the miraculous. Maybe it's because John saw Jesus as the Word made flesh. John 1 and 1, he said, the beginning, the Word was, was with God and the Word was God. And in 14, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. In John's one book, Jesus, the Word made flesh, turned water into wine. He healed the nobleman's son. He healed the impotent man at the pool of Bethesda on the Sabbath. He fed 5,000 men plus women and children. He walked on the water. He healed a man born blind. In fact, there are 36 confirmed miracles in the New Testament. Four are deliverance and six are nature and element. Three are dead being raised and 23 are healing. Everybody say Jesus heals. Jesus, Jesus saves. But in chapter 11, Jesus outdid all that he had ever done put together in one miracle when he raised a man from the grave. He raised a man. He had been dead four days. He raised Jairus' daughter who had just died and she was still warm. He raised the widow's son of Nain that, had, been, that it, had, it been, had it died for a while and he was on his way to the graveyard. But when Lazarus was raised, it was a new day a brand new day in the life of Israel and in Jesus' ministry. For he tarried two days after he heard the news of Lazarus' sickness. And then he said, when he heard that Lazarus was dead, he said, Lazarus is dead, watch this now, and I am glad for your sakes that I wasn't there because I want to take this generation to a level of faith that they have never witnessed in their life. I'm gonna do something with this miracle that I've never done in my ministry and we're gonna see some things and people are gonna be talking about it on August the 27th, 2021 in Austin, Texas. I'm gonna change the whole nature of faith. Oh yeah. See, the Jews strongly believed that after three days, the body began to decompose. They didn't embalm like the Egyptians. And corruption would set in. And the body's breakdown was in motion. It was what they call the fourth day, the goodbye day, the farewell day. <laughs> this is when God can't help you day. It's the day that's after the day that he could help you. Anybody had a day four in your life, in your life? <laughs> I've had some day fours. Well, God, I got something now. I don't know if you can help me with this. And God said, step aside, son. I can do anything. There is nothing impossible with me. Jesus stepped into Bethany and on the finish day, on the over, it's over, Jesus, on the grieving Mary and the doubting Martha, their finish was his fire and their debacle was his delight. For on that day, not only did he take the nation of Israel, he took the household of Lazarus and all that would look upon him to a totally different level, a brand new place of a miracle like they would never witness again. When in essence he said, nothing is ever too far dead. 
Nothing is ever too far gone. It's never too far over. For nothing is impossible with me. I can turn everything around. <clears throat> I can fix anything in anybody because I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus didn't talk about resurrection. He was resurrection. Jesus didn't just show up at funerals. He raised the dead at funerals. Jesus is the resurrection. Folks, not a was, he still is today. Clap your hand. I don't care what your situation is. He is still the resurrection and the life. He's still resurrection in life. He's still resurrection in life. He's still resurrection in life right now today. So he goes to the graveyard and he uses these words, Lazarus come forth. Now, if he hadn't said Lazarus, everything in the grave would have come forth. <laughs> and I'm sure that there were some Lazaruses that would have come forth, but he didn't let them hear what Lazarus heard. And he who was dead came out, the Bible said, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was bound about with a napkin. Then Jesus said unto them, loose him and let him go. May I introduce the city of Bethany's Freedom Life Group. See, dead people that went to graves for the Israelis, for the Hebrew people, not the Egyptian, but the Hebrew people, they had what they called this linen that they wrapped the body in, around the head and around the body. And then they would, then they would bring all kinds of spices. And then they would bring something like a, maybe a plaster that they would put on it behind, on top of these spices so that they could hold the body in place when it started to decompose, it wouldn't go anywhere. In other words, it was like a sarcophagus that the Egyptians spoke about. And so they would hold that body intact. Then they would put it around his head <laughs> and they would do the same thing. And so after about three days, that was hard. It wasn't going anywhere. It was like he was in a casket that was fit, fit like a, a body shirt. And so, but when Jesus called him out, he said, loose him and let him go. It wasn't like they had to unwrap him. It was like they had to get some chisels after him. They had to get a saw. They had to get some things that could break down that plaster Paris and open up so the perfume of what he was was going to shine again and smell again. Here's what I want to tell you, folks. Here's what I want to say. Here's what I want to say. He needed people in Bethany who knew how to roll away stones and take off grave clothes. We can't do the miracle of resurrection. Jesus is the resurrection in life. But the first people Lazarus saw was the last people who gave up on him. They didn't, they didn't want to give up on him. They wanted him to live. We can't help the stones and the grave attire, things that bind and create blindness. And that's what freedom groups are all about. We want to take you from a level of hell saying you can't ever get over particular things. No, it's not the 12-step program. It's a spiritual journey. It's a spiritual journey that lets you deal with grief, lets you deal with past failures, lets you deal with doubts, lets you deal with abuse. Let you deal with hardships of your life and come out of it saying, I can do this thing called Christianity. I can do this thing called being born again. I can live in freedom. <laughs> Lazarus was let go. Things that bind and create blindness was on him. Not only was he speaking to Lazarus, he was speaking to a generation standing before him and I've done too much ad lib and I'm behind in my time. Come forth. He was telling a nation, come forth. I know you're dead in sin. I know you're dead in theology. I know you're dead in expectation. I know you're dead in faith. And you've been dead for four days or 400 years. 
because it had been 400 years since Malachi had put his pen down and quit writing the gospel or the, the prophecy of Malachi. Nobody heard from God for 400 years. And Jesus was saying, I've got to resurrect you as well as resurrect him. But if I can raise a dead man back to life, he's thinking, I can raise a generation back to life. And a dead man arose. And though God was reaching for a nation, a generation, he did it by reaching for one man. One man. That's always been and still is his method of operation, the raising of one man, one woman. Still has an impact on a nation, a city, a people. Psalm 68 says God sets the solitary in families. He brings out those which are bound in chains. Anybody here ever walked out of some chains that had you bound? Come on. Come on now. He does. Imagine. Imagine the feeling of the family and the town. When the demoniac of Gadara with 2,000 demons went home clean, free of demons in his right mind. Or how about the woman in John 4 who met Jesus at a well? having been married five times, living with her sixth man. But when Jesus gave her a drink of living water, she went back to her city and brought the whole town to him. Brought the whole town to him. The impact that a, that, that a change to one person can bring to a family, a city is phenomenal. Only eternity can tell the story. How many people has Job's life changed? The old man Job in the Old Testament. God looked at the devil one day and declared, have you considered him? Go take care of him. Do what you got to do. But I'm telling you, he's not going to deny me. He's going to stay true. And Job stayed true. I have some miracles running around there. And I have some people that are showing forth grace and mercy, which brings me to my text today. I'm just now reading it. John 12, much people of the Jews therefore knew that Jesus was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also. Say it with me, Lazarus also, Lazarus. whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priest consulted that they might put Lazarus to death. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the Greeks came to the disciples saying, Sirs, we would see Jesus. The world really wants to see Jesus. They don't want to see dead religion. They don't want to walk into a legalistic place. They want to witness the power of Jesus Christ. That's what the world wants. However, when he performs life-changing miracles to people, then they want to see Lazarus also. They want to see the miracle. Lazarus was the miracle of the resurrection. Lazarus was the dream accomplished. Lazarus was the goal attained. They want to see what a man looks like <laughs> that had been dead four days. They want to see what a man loosed of grave clothes looks like. They want to see what a man that was dead in sin, now resurrected by the power of God, acts like. People want to see the change. They want to see the difference. They want to see what a new man in Christ looks like. Amen. Lazarus became an irresistible attraction. He had been brought to life. He was with Jesus eating supper with him and he was alive. He was loose and he was lethal. They wrote a play about him that they did. In, I, I don't know if they did on Broadway, but it was a massive play across America years ago called Lazarus Laughed. And the whole story is about Lazarus being threatened with death again <laughs> after he'd been raised from the dead. And he just laughed. The whole thing's about Lazarus laughing about death. Because once you have been raised from death, raised from your sins, raised from your past, raised from all the things that used to torment you into a new life, hey, don't come in here threatening me with that again. I know what resurrection's all about. I know what living a brand new life is all about. Come on, clap your hands. See, what I'm trying to preach today is that some people are alive, but they're bound. But when one is alive and free, he or she is lethal. That's why we push and promote freedom life groups. I've had people ask me, Pastor, does so-and-so go to your church? I said, yeah, they're great people. Let me, let me just pause here and put this and just tell you real quick. Let me, let me put this on pause. Everybody here is a great person. Pastor, you don't know me. I don't, I don't care. You're a great person. 
because God made you. You're a great person. And so, and so when people ask, how are they doing? I say, they're doing wonderful. I always say that. There's no F students in this house. There's no D students, C students, B students. Everybody's A, A plus. Plus, plus, plus. Amen. You know why? Because Jesus fixed you. Not a man, Jesus fixed you. And then they'll sometimes say, you know, I knew that old boy, I knew that lady. Man, they were some bad people. And I said, really? He said, yeah, you want to know? I said, no, I don't want to know. I don't care to know. Don't tell me what they've done. Let me tell you where they're going. Don't tell me what they've done. Woo! I felt that one a little bit. I'm on my way to heaven and the journey's getting sweeter every day. Yeah, they've been changed. Try dead to alive. Try bound to now free. Oh, yes. The world came to see Jesus that day. But when they came, they also came to see Lazarus, a freed Lazarus, a man of freedom. For if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and everything is brand new. Say it with me. All things are new. Let me remind you that Lazarus was sitting at supper alive and loosed, not alive and bound. I don't think hell would mind it nearly as much if saved people were still bound. Alive, yet bound. Lazarus was not only alive, but he was free, unfettered, no chains. That's what freedom does. Hell's problem is not your aliveness. Hell's problem is your freedom. In the book of Genesis chapter 32, there's a story of a man named Jacob who wrestled with an angel all night long and woke up with a new name. When the dawn came, his name was Israel because he said, as a prince, you found favor with God and a new lamp and a new start. And he arose the next morning, though, to go meet Esau. Esau was his enemy. It was his own brother, but he was his enemy. Esau was bringing 400 men to meet him. And uh, Jacob was having some struggles with that. And so the first thing he did after he had wrestled all night with an angel and got a new identity he divided the substance that he had, letting the enemy know without saying that I'm afraid of meeting you with all God has blessed me with. So I'll just bring half. I want to be alive, but you see, I've got these things that I don't want somebody to see. I've got some traits. I've got some yesterdays. I've got some stuff. I've got some of these generational curses that I just can't let go of. And I need to let go of them. So I'm going to show you my Israel side, but I'm not going to bring everything to the table. Let me declare something to you. When you bring it all to the table, when you bring Jacob, the beguiler, the deceiver, the interloper, along with Israel, the mighty prince with God, when you bring it all to the table, God takes all that stuff out of your past and causes you to have the most beautiful future you've ever seen in your life. What I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to say is that we're on this journey. We're on this journey and we don't need to be bringing stuff with us that don't belong on this journey. We need to go ahead and put it under the blood and put it under grace and let it be taken away and not let it stump us and stop us and bind us and chain us on our journey. Come on, he that the son is set free is free. Indeed. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. 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 May I tell all of you, you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. God poured something into us that brought salvation and it wasn't cheap. The angel asked Jacob, what is your name? It wasn't for the angel's sake. It was for Jacob's sake. Because when Jacob said Jacob and finally told the truth who he was. You see, the last time someone had asked him his name, he had said Esau. He had lied to his father. The angel wanted the truth. That's all that will make you free is the truth. This world deserves the truth. That's still the question today posed by the world. What is your name? Here's what we all need to answer. 
today, right now, I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. And it does not yet appear what I shall be. But I know when I shall see him, I shall be like him. For I shall see him as he is. It's time to quit changing our identity. The chameleon spirit's got to go. When an angel asks you your name, telling the truth, speak with freedom. Let hell and the enemy know who you really are. You're a child of God. Randy, if you'll come, I need to close. I need to close. There are 70 kings in the book of Judges chapter 1 under one table that were chained. They were captured by another king, 70 of them. Kings, kings, not servants, not slaves, kings, kings. And the man had cut their thumbs off and cut their big toes off because he wanted to cripple them just enough so that they couldn't conquer. They couldn't hold anything or they couldn't walk right. The big toe is your balance. They couldn't walk. He wanted to cripple them, not make them whole. And that's what hell's situation is with all of us. Hell wants, hell wants you under the table. Alive, but crippled. Hell wants half. He doesn't mind you alive. He wants you bound. There are people looking in the windows of the church, though, seeing about the miracle, checking on the Lazaruses of today. Can you imagine what they said about Lazarus when they saw him? The Bible said they wanted to kill him because an alive, unbound Lazarus is not good for hell's business. The miracle made people believe on Jesus as never before. And although we are miracles, hell just doesn't want us acting like a miracle. I close today with this. I close today with this. New York Times had a reporter named Nicholas Kristof. And he went to a brothel one day to do a story. And he chose two Cambodian prostitutes and attempted to buy their freedom from the brothel owners. And he selected women who were there against their will, willing to tell their story. They wanted out. The first was a simple exchange, $150, and she left. The second proved more difficult. The owner demanded more money. He wanted $203, and the price was paid. But then the prostitute said she had pawned her cell phone and wanted it back, and it took $55 to get it back. The buyer said, forget the phone. Don't worry about it. We'll buy you another one. She started crying, ran back to the brothel, went to her room, shut the door, all for a $55 cell phone. The other women begged, take your freedom. Even the brothel owner said, you might ought to get out of here while you have the chance. Go. And when the reporter said he'd pay for the cell phone, she then wanted the jewelry that she had lost. Then something else surfaced, and Christoph said, I could not get her talked into leaving. He said, why is it so hard to get people out of a lifestyle of bondage? All I offered was freedom. Then he said, does anyone want freedom? That's my question today. Is there some Lazarus all souls in the house today, alive and unbound? 107 years ago this month, headed to the South Pole was a ship called the Endurance, captained by Sir Ernest Shackleton in the Antarctic. And they got in some ice. And Shackleton made a bad decision. He decided to stop and wait for the break in the ice. It was a fateful decision. They're just 100 miles from the South Pole and they stopped and they never made it and they didn't make it back. They were lost. Here's what I want to tell you. I'm closing today, but here's what I want to tell you. When you make up your mind, make up your mind. Don't procrastinate. Make up your mind. This is what I want to do. Summer is ended and some of us are not saved, but I want to see you saved. I want to see you on your way to heaven. I want you to see, to see you receiving the Lord in your life. I want that to happen in your life. And some of us are going to see that today. But here's what I want to tell you. When you make up your mind, make up your mind and say, I'm going forward. I'm going forward. I remember the day I made my choice. I remember that day. Never forget it. This is what I want. This is what I'm going to do. Now, I was real old, mature. I was nine years old. But I made up my mind. That's what I'm going to do. And this weekend, I celebrate 51 years in the ministry. This weekend. This is what I want to do. This is it. This is it. Ain't nothing else. Oh, hallelujah. Ain't nothing else. 
this is what I want to do. I, uh, <laughs> I had an old boy years ago when we built the first church here that we built a church out of that church to make this church. That's complicated. Don't worry about it. <laughs> he was a famous guitar player here in Austin, played with Willie and Billy, Stevie Ray Vaughan and, and all them boys, played some big time stuff. And he walked in one day, he used to be in an AA building right across the street here. And he walked in on Wednesday night, somebody over there said, he said, I've been here a lot of times. I, I, I need something, maybe a little bit more. And, and I, I believe in the 12-step program. Freedom is not a 12-step program, but I believe in the 12-step program. I, I think it works. But they said, you know, might ought to go to that church over there. I said, I hear that people get healed over there at that church. He walked in on a Wednesday night crying and I went back to him and he said, preacher, he said, I've known a lot of fame, but he said, I'm, I'm, I'm hurting. I'm, I'm broken and I'm hurting. And I said, Larry, I saw he was real emotional and I didn't want him to just make an emotional decision. I wanted him to make a decision that he was determined to live for God. So I said, why don't you come back tomorrow at four o'clock, come to my office. We'll have a little Bible study. I'll lead you to the Lord. If you want to be water baptized, I'll baptize you. He said, you would? I said, yeah. He said, I'll be here. So the next day in the office, I told the guys, I said, hey, that guy that was here last night at church, he's coming today at four o'clock to have a Bible study. And my staff said, oh, pastor, he ain't going to show up. He ain't going to show up. And I said, for the first time in my life, I said, you want a better burger on it? <laughs> that happened. That happened. And all of them said, yes. I said, okay, if I win, every one of you have to, individually have to buy me a burger. And if I, if I don't win, I'll buy all y'all a burger. And they said, it's on. He's not going to be here. Not only did he show up, he showed up 15 minutes early. And I, I said, I said, oh, it's burger time. It's burger time. I led him to Jesus. Put him in the water. He said, pastor, I'm pretty rank center. And I said, it don't matter. It don't matter. God's got this. And he said, you might ought to hold me under a little longer. <laughs> he really said that. And I said, okay, I will. Larry, if you're watching, I love you, buddy. He lives in another town now. I hate he's not here because I'd have him stand up and come up here. You'd love Larry Wilson. He's amazing. But what he did do after I baptized him and he received the Lord in his life, he brought his girlfriend who was a new age girl and she thought she is God. And then she realized there was a God and she wasn't him. And I, I married them. They were the first people I married in the, in the new building that we built back in 1996. And, <laughs> and I'm going to show you what he did. See this youngin' right here? Wave your hand, Phil. See that youngin' right there? Wave your hand, Jeff. He taught these boys how to play guitar when they was this big. I love y'all. I love you. And Larry Wilson still lives in Austin, Texas because the change came off one day. Alive and free. Alive and free. Would you stand? You're incredible, incredible people. And I've gone long enough. You know why I went long? Because they took a lot of my time. And I hadn't preached all this month and so I was kind of ready to let it go today. Now listen to me. I want you to raise your hands all over the building and I want to bless this whole congregation. Dear Father, in the name of the Lord, I pray for people in this house right now. I pray for people that are wrestling with yesterdays and wrestling with the past and wrestling with bondage and being chained and not being free. And God, I loose those chains. I rebuke them. I stand against them in the name of the Lord. And let them know without a shadow of a doubt that you're with them, you're walking with them. But let them also know, Lord, that it takes a little resistance on their part to walk this journey because it does have a cross involved in it. Now bless this people and bless this church. And may we move forward, not only in salvation, but in freedom, not only in knowing the resurrection, but being un unwrapped and being free 
from our past. For it's in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said amen. amen. Now bow your heads. I want everybody that would like to have healing, deliverance, or salvation, raise your hand. Well, nobody's looking. Raise your hand. All right, put it down right quick. Right quick. I'm going to dismiss this congregation. We'll be back Wednesday night. And you that raise your hands, if you'd like to spend some time with Pastor, I'm going to pray with you up here. So just come down to the front when we dismiss, and we'll have prayer for you today. We had a lot of salvations in the first service. You may leave. God bless. We'll see you Wednesday. Thank you for being here today. Go sign up for a life group. Go sign up for one. Amen. I'll be announcing mine. I love you. God bless you. Have a great day.